Welcome back to Millennials Are Killing Capitalism Live. Uh, today, we have again with us Abdul Jawad Omar. Um, you know, we're going to, among other things, discuss an essay that was published, I think, within the last week to 10 days. Time doesn't mean anything anymore. Um, called uh, Bleeding Forms Beyond the Intifada. Um, there's some elements of this that we've discussed all, already, so we'll go into kind of some specific parts of it. Um, yeah, and then we're just going to talk, we're going to talk about some of the recent events. Obviously, there's, there's a lot going on, um, I think that warrants more discussion. And, um, so happy to, of course, always to have a boot back on to, you know, talk us through some of these things. And this makes our, I think I said seventh last time it was, this is actually the seventh conversation that we've had with a boot, uh, and I thought it was initially that we started in October. We actually didn't start until November having these discussions. So, um, you know, anyway, uh, very grateful to him for joining us again. So, Abud, welcome to the show again. Yeah, thanks, Jared. It's good to be with you again as well. Good, good to be with you. Um, so, yeah, so, um, you know, actually, I wanted to start with, uh, just a Twitter thread that you had written um, a few weeks ago, actually, I think like a day or two, probably after I think the last conversation we had, which was a month ago now. Um, and you wrote a thread about Aaron Bushnell. And, you know, I thought it was a very moving tribute, um, but also captured, you know, um, you know, the feelings that you have at least at the time, you know, and you could talk about maybe if they've shifted at all um, about the experience of the the West Bank and your experience in the West Bank. And, you know, I actually was struck by and I've had this feeling talking to you, but also talking to um, Rowan and Fatih as well, you know, um, of kind of like um, in some ways that there's similarities between some of the feelings that you have being in the West Bank that we might have in the States or other people might have in the UK in terms of kind of, you know, feeling like the conditions for the type of resistance that you would actually, you know, hope into existence or want to be a part of right now just don't feel like they're quite there. And that this is in part because of the kind of neo-colonial, um, you know, things. But anyways, I'll let you put it in your own words. And obviously, I'm not trying to compare the experience of, you know, a white person living in the States with a Palestinian living in the West Bank. But just as you were talking to the kind of psychology and affective aspects of it, it it still brought those it it, it brought me to feeling more perhaps like there were some similarities in terms of, you know, feeling a little bit like, you know, there's not a clear way forward right now. I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't think you're making a big uh, leap if we take into consideration um, actually also one of the parts of the essay that I've written and one of the issues that we've discussed, you know, this form of colonialism that we face that dissects like geography in different ways. It, you know, it renders uh, a place like Gaza uh, very far away um, from the West Bank, although it's very close. So, um, you know, it's easier for me to come to the States than to go to Gaza, uh, not even at this particular moment, even before October 7th. Um, and it's almost uh, tough to even imagine or hard to imagine the city, its people, um, unless you have the privilege of going there through very like restrictive uh, license that the israeli regime itself gives people uh, and some workers in like foreign ngos etc that you know make it into gaza and you know have stories about visiting gaza or some of the gazans that come here and talk about gaza uh, for different reasons so um yeah i mean for the past um couple of decades you know palestinians of the west bank simply have no access uh to gaza and have little um relationship on a physical and personal level uh, to that part of Palestine. Again, although it's like one hour, an hour and a half, two hour ride from uh, whatever place in, in the West Bank you are in. 
Um, so this kind of renders, you know, distance a, a, a similarity between somebody in the UK and somebody in Palestine when it comes to like, um, you know, being close yet distant, being uh, understanding that the war in Gaza is just one part of this whole war on Palestine for a hundred years, um, being captive also in your own system of um, you know, a native authority that cooperates with the Israelis, an authoritarian system that renders the capacity to resist, you know, futile, um, uh, or not futile, I, I would say, more or less, um, less organized, uh, less concentrated, less capable. I mean, so there are these systems in place in the West Bank that also render Palestinians feeling a sense of uh, uh, incapacitated and paralyzed, and um, you know, with all the 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 signs and symptoms that come with that, the anger that doesn't go outside, uh, you know, the body, but you know, remains within. Uh, the feeling of guilt, um, the feeling that surrounds a person who at the moment is surviving this intense violence, but also has his own violence to reckon with, and at the same time feeling that they're not doing enough. And I think most people in the West Bank, they also feel targeted. There's a lot of fear um, that comes with what's happening in Gaza, this taking off the gloves and, you know, taking uh, Gaza down in the world and, um, making it a place where total power can be exercised without any kind of um, any restrictions. Um, you know, the, ki the killing, the maiming, uh, exaggerating of bodies from, um, you know, um, uh, exaggerating dead bodies or, you know, um, you know, destroying hospitals, destroying buildings, uh, destroying the infrastructure, um, destroying mosques, churches. Um, this kind of total war where civilians are like killed by air, as we saw in the recent videos that are coming out, uh, without you know any sense of uh, you know uh, management of the use of power. Like at this moment, it's it seems like Israel is using, um, let's put it, most of its power uh, without any kind of regard to anything. Um, so, and, and we know that what happens and is happening in Gaza is not something very distant from the West Bank itself. So I think that is also uh, a truth that a lot of Palestinians in the West Bank are uh, starting uh, to let seep in and recognize. Um, so yeah, I mean, it is different in this manner. It's different because here there's also another kind of war happening. Um, but at the same time, it's very fundamental for a lot of people to understand that, you know, the West Bank and even Gaza at some level was kind of this kind of post-colonial, you know, governance structure that is folded within this kind of settler colonial or the persistence of colonialism itself. So it, it creates kind of like an out of joint relationship to also politics and war and the colonial relationship itself. It creates a sense that you can live kind of this everyday rhythm without being engaged in, you know, the horizon of inhalation that is coming uh, through. It allows you to forget the occupation at times, not remember it, you know. And so if you're sitting in the middle of Ramallah and go to like, I don't know, uh, your daily routine to work, home, uh, to some cafe with friends, and you live within this like very narrow, small space, um, uh, then, you know, you could at this kind of everyday experience, forget that there's an occupation, a military occupation. A lot of Palestinians in the West Bank, you know, clinch to this kind of forgetfulness because that's the only way they can like truly survive. Although they, you know, there is something in the background that, you know, nags you that there's something completely abnormal about the life that we live and about uh, the way uh, other people dominate uh, every aspects of our lives. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I mean, do you want to say anything specifically about how Aaron Bushnell's like act, like sort of the, the feelings that that brought out related to that? Well, I mean, I, I think I've, I've tensed it in myself, but a lot of people around me that 
this, um, you know, inability to bear witness to what's unfolding and pretend uh, that, you know, life goes on. Um, that there's this person who's doing something about it at some level. Um, and I think it brought out, you know, a lot of this kind of internalized anger that has been uh, incapable of finding like a, a way to express itself on a collective coordinated level or, you know, in terms of turning this kind of like anger to action uh, or political action. Um, you know, in the beginning months of, in the beginning month of uh, the current war, um, you know, a lot of people in the West Bank were going out on the street and trying to do something. And I think there was that collective kind of, um, you know, Lenin's um, question, what is to be done? And in this type of authoritarian regime with this dual carceral system that we live under, um, with um, the lack of a social organized movement, although some signs of a uh, new armed movement is rising, at least in the past couple of years, um, means that people feel lonely um, on some level. It's not the form of solitude that is very productive, and I don't mean lonely in a sense of not having people around, but I think, I think it's a lonely that is uh, on a more political level, which means that they're incapable of trusting others politically and incapable of building and forging these links that could enable um, a form of collective action uh, to appear. And this has a history why at this moment you feel the sense of, of lack that pervades, uh, you know, our movements within the city and our lives. Again, some people clinch to this kind of like forgetfulness, but at the same time, um, I think that for most people, or for a lot of people, um, it just feels like a lonely world where you're, um, you know, you have no clue about the power of uh, collective action and agency, where you cannot really forge uh, the communication needed for uh, such collective power and agency, and for it to appear. Of course, it depends on the classes in, in the West Bank, and I, I don't want to like make this kind of overriding, simplifying statements, uh, because it's not always true, and there are always means that people find uh, to express uh, and materially manifest their own form of uh, political engagement and resistance exists in the West Bank. Um, but on the ability to organize and uh, on the ability to um, create, um, you know, a spontaneous moment where, you know, people's creativity comes across, I think there's a lot of lack in the West Bank when it comes to that. Um, and it leaves people kind of like shattered, but internally. <clears throat> and and that renders a lot of the anger um, individualistic in, in many ways. It's not kind of like this collective anger. And I think for Aaron, I mean, this is also kind of projecting onto Aaron because I don't want to place a lot of motivations on Aaron's actions. You know, I don't know him. And it's always dangerous to like, you know, um, um, you know, speak about other people's um, experiences and why they did what they did but at least from his statement and uh, and the way he acted i think um you know this kind of burning fire within that you know manifests uh on the outside of the body and through this act of self-sacrifice and self-emulation i think on, on 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 multiple levels i think that that's something that uh, many people across the world feel um but aaron just you know brought it out in a more material and expressive level and that's why i think you know it touched something in me but it touched something in a lot of palestinians who um you know saw this act also coming from somebody not necessarily living within the colonial condition within palestine itself uh but still doing it out of solidarity and out of this kind of uh feeling of responsibility and uh, uh and not wanting to bear witness to his own government's also uh, complicity and identification with Israel action. So 
Um, so these these are the things that you know, but out but on a very emotional level, yeah. And I think you know many people could relate to that, whether in the West Bank, or in Palestine forty eight, or in Palestinian diaspora, or for all the people who are concerned about what's happening in Palestine from across the globe, uh, wherever they are. Yeah, definitely. Um, I appreciate you know you sharing all those reflections. The other kind of I mean, there's so so much going on right now, but you know, one of the things that I did want to talk about a little bit because we haven't talked about it yet on um, our platform is, you know, what's taking place at Al Shifa currently. Um, you know, and this might preempt some of the other questions that I have for you, but it's you know, it's just very heavy on my mind. I think on everyone's mind right now, um, you know, because it. It, it's like one of the ways of uh, the sort of psychological elements of this war as well. I mean, obviously it's quite material, but you know, every time you kind of get this feeling like, Oh, maybe it's, maybe it's starting to ease up a little bit. Maybe, maybe, you know, and you've talked about this too, about how there becomes this kind of acceptance of, well, we've moved from a thousand people being killed today to a hundred, you kill the day to a hundred or, you know, 200 or whatever, the numbers are lessening. It's becoming a sort of quote unquote lower intensity, you know, war in certain ways. Um, and obviously that, you know, one of the big issues with that is that this war is also a war of starvation, right? It's a war of, um, you know, there's so many different registers of it. It's not just who's, um, you know, shot or bombed or whatever. Um, but, you know, this is a moment where the depravity and the, um, you know, I mean, it's just like war crimes on a level that are just, um, you know, I don't know how to describe it. I didn't expect, I'll say this, I didn't expect to see things like this occurring in my lifetime, you know. Um, uh, you know, obviously, you know, um, we could talk about how we've gotten here, right, and how, you know, there's been a systemic campaign of Israel of continuing to intentionally transgress you know what we would call the rules of war or international law to commit these atrocities that then become somewhat normalized and it gets to a point where you know it, it become people sort of i think lose i guess one of the thing i would say is like nora ericat uh recently had this discussion and she's somebody you know she's Palestinian. She's worked within the international um, law realm. She's worked at elite universities. Um, and so she's worked very much within the registers of, you know, policy, law, um, you know, for for better or worse. Right. And um, but she's she's tried for decades to work in that realm. And I think done, you know, the best that she could in that space. And you know, she was like the other day, she was like one, she was said, it's, you know, I understand why all of you here are listening to me are like very cynical about the law right now. And I don't want to take away your cynicism. Right. Um, you know, and also she just talked about how like she's been somebody for decades who's kind of advocated that Palestinians also have to accept some form of coexistence. Right. Or whatever. And she was like, anybody who's saying that right now, She's like, it, how how do you coexist with this, right? Like, how could you ask, how could you place that demand upon people? Um, and so, you know, I don't know. I mean, I you know, I guess one of the things I wanted to ask you, and it's, I know you can't really get into the, you know, the minds and the, the rationale, but like, what the hell are they doing? Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I don't know what else this brings out in you, this discussion about Al Shifa right now. I mean, look, on a very, um, you know, tactical level, a Shifa is uh, an operation that was meant to destroy the ability of uh, the Palestinian resistance groups in, in the northern Gaza Strip to rearrange um, and uh, exert some sort of social organization in the north. And... Um, and here, when I say resistance groups, I'm not—I don't mean resistance operatives that are like engaged in the battle. 
uh, but largely people who are involved in like the civilian side of things, um, governance, policing, um, attempts to like, you know, rejuvenate the hospital, uh, create like social networks, ensure that armed gangs do not take control or, you know, uh, steal the aid coming into northern Gaza. Um, there's an here an Israeli intentionality at play, which is to sustain this order um, and um, in the hopes of driving also the people that remain in the northern Gaza Strip outside. And I think here we should just stop and say that there's, um, you know, there's there's an amazing uh, and perhaps uh, also inspiring element in all of this that many people remained in northern Gaza Strip in the hundreds of thousands and that not all people were uh, convinced or did leave the northern Gaza Strip despite um, you know Israel's attempt at driving most people outside of uh, the northern Gaza Strip but having said that and it, and it shows that you know on some level this kind of like steadfastness and uh, people's ability to also assert their agency by just staying and staying put despite the horror and despite the starvation and despite a lot of the, the other elements that are at play and also the resistance capacity to reassert its uh, control. Um, uh, we don't know after the Shifa operation what, what really happens, but you know, there's that intentionality of like to maintain this order. Part of it is a negotiating tactic that deals with the ceasefire like negotiations, but part of it is, is you know, Again, opening this kind of horizon uh, within, uh, you know, Israeli thinking for what we could do um, in terms of the, of Gaza, whether it's ethnic cleansing, whether it's sustaining this kind of form of uh, the ungovernability and unlivability of Gaza Strip, or also uh, sustaining a form of disorder or finding alternatives uh, to Hamas uh, and the armed Palestinian resistance groups. Uh, that would come and, you know, uh, replace uh, in terms of governance and civil organization. And I think part of all of that, you know, all of this is part of these type of moves of pressuring uh, people in Gaza to find another solution um, to governance and the presence of armed uh, resistance and forcing the armed resistance to capitulate or surrender or at least agree to some sort of governance structure that is more amenable and cooperative with the Israelis in a you know post-war scenario. So there's that kind of political level to it. However, having said that, I think that it goes beyond like, you know, um, intentional, strategic, rational, utilitarian thinking. Um, um, and I think throughout this war, I mean, this is one of the art, you know, also elements in the essay that I was, I've written, and I, I don't like. It's not my favorite essay, to be honest, but, but, I've written it, so I don't know. Um, but in in many ways, um, I appreciate um, you saying that. Not, I like the essay, but I I appreciate that as somebody who has also written essays and has they're not always my favorite, so I I, I get it. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's not my favorite for a lot of reasons, but I think. Uh, one of one of the elements that I was trying to deal with, and I don't think I was successfully able to deal with, is like you know this kind of like the co-presence within this uh, you know um, within all the events from October seventh and afterwards of kind of like strategy and intentionality of the actors and uh, outcomes and thinking you know through utilitarian terms. But also the co-presence alongside that of you know, you know things like excess and um, you know elements that cannot be folded easily within within these terms. You know, like um, I think this war, um, in specifically on the Israeli side, you know, where already it was besieging Gaza, and as you know, Norman Finkelstein would say, it was already a concentration camp, and now it's exercising this kind of form of total power over it. Um, you know, um, unleashing uh, the beast, uh, taking pleasure uh, in the kill, and attempting um, or uh, trying to completely render uh, people in Gaza uh, starved, helpless 
without any kind of judicial or even uh, you know um, uh, judicial personality or judicial subjectivity or any kind of rights or any kind of um, uh, you know human presence. And I think you know if we hearken back to Gallant's words, the Minister of Defense in Israel in the beginning of the war, these are human animals. I think that in many ways there is something with Israel's strategy that you know aligns closely to turning Palestinians in Gaza um, to this kind of basic or base uh, level of animality, of disorder, lack of political organization, lack of ability to reach food, uh, starvation, um, lack of water, electricity, a lack of all uh, judicial rights when it comes to have killing zones. Um, so there's this kind of exercise um, that is going on where this Zionist ideology is exercising this form of total power and it speaks in these terms. It speaks in terms of total victory and, uh, you know, and, you know, it reached the point of contemplating even nuclear weapons and, and, and you know, throwing them at Palestinians in Gaza or people uh, in the region that, you know, just reject this colonial state and its presence uh, in the midst of the Arab world. So I think on, on multiple levels, there is that, that element that is not completely folded easily within this kind of rational, strategic, negotiating type of, uh, you know, uh, terminology, the, the, the political terminology, uh, the political science terminology, the international relations terminology, uh, you know, the realism terminology that, you know, uh, of people acting out of self-interest. Um, there is something else also going on. And, and, and this is partially also the case with, with also resistance as this kind of like uh, anti-concept. And I think in Shifa, there is that element, you know, like uh, why would you um, go and attack and kill Palestinian civil uh, um, uh, officials that are um, engaged in attempting to make sure that, you know, aid reaches people without disorder, without, you know, uh, uh, without armed gangs taking control and without as well uh, massacres happening on your behest. And I think this is this is something that they wanted to enshrine. And, you know, I mean, in in the massacres in the past, you know, a couple of weeks in northern Gaza Strip, Israel was taking uh, videos. And of course, it released them out of this idea that it's trying to absolve itself that we didn't kill the Palestinians in the, in, in in, in these massacres. However, I think they wanted to enshrine and imprint and burn in the consciousness of the Palestinians themselves, but also uh, all, their, all the people that support them, that this is the form of power that we're willing to exercise. We're willing to kill you while you're waiting for the food to reach you. We're willing to like uh, render you starved, but at the same time, while you're starved and trying to survive and find food, we're still willing, willing to, to conduct a massacre. So there's that level that is uh, being exercised in terms of, of, of Israel's relationship to power at this moment that is not completely either strategic or utilitarian or, and it cannot be folded only within these terms. A lot of people will say, look, you know, well, Israel has this kind of like, they want to build a, an isolation between uh, Gaza and uh, you know, the Gaza envelope settlements that were attacked in October 7th. Um, they want to uh, ethnically cleanse or they want to... I think this is all, you know, in terms of how Israel is moving on in deforming the Gaza Strip. There is a systematic, rationalized plan. And it has some idea of, of how it wants to, you know, assert control over the Strip or maintain some sort of presence. Um, creating buffer zones, uh, perhaps uh, creating it as a uh, as a place from which um, you know Palestinians cannot sustain their their lives for a long time, and then they start searching for alternatives. But I think there is this kind of you know um, non-rational, nonsensical uh, element in this exercise of power. Um, 
this desire to exercise power for power's sake uh, and to assert this kind of God complex again, which remains at the heart of, I think, Zionism and its uh, colonial infrastructure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the... Yeah, as you said, God complex, that's what I was thinking. You know, I mean, it's like this, like, you know, you think about the term sovereignty and like there's, I think there's a lot of kind of beautiful expressions of of what sovereignty can mean from a kind of anti-colonial um, perspective. Um, but, you know, the, the, the sovereignty of... Um, you know, occupying powers of settler colonial powers, you know, I mean, it's just like, it's, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a fucked up thing. Um, so let's see, I wanted to talk, well, before we get into that, so I do want to talk a little bit about resistance more and deforming. Um, somebody asked a question I want to raise up though, uh, because this is on my mind as well as, you know, what do people in Ramallah, Ramallah feel about the most recent resistance operation near the Dolevs, um, settlement, um, this for folks who don't know, um, there was a martyr, uh, Mujahid, uh, Barakat Mansur Karaja. I probably butchered that name. Um, but he, um, I took a, a solo operation. I think it was like five or six hours that he was, um, you know, on the offensive against, um, you know, IOF forces and so on. Maybe you could tell a little bit more, but, um, yeah, I mean, and then, I mean, there's also, there's other resistance, you know, I think from, you know, Janine, we've seen more acts recently. I mean, you know, I know that as you've said, it's not resistance in the white, in the West bank is not, you know, as widespread it's, it's isolated to certain areas and so on, but, um, yeah, say a little bit about these these acts and how they're how they're resonating in in the West Bank. I mean, look, I, I don't think there's something that you know we talked about this when we talked about insurgency and counterinsurgency in the West Bank, and I've I've mentioned that a couple of times. But when it comes to this specific operation, we have Mujahid Karaja, who is from a small village next to Ramallah called Derbzir, and you know the immediate environment where Derbzir you know, Lays is near, you know, a, a, a ring of settlements that shook the Ramallah area uh, from the western uh, uh, side. Um, and Dolev is one of these settlements and it's linked through a road that goes through like a narrow um, and highly uh, vulnerable uh, area because the Palestinian villages, you know, are on the high ground while the road is on the low ground. And it used to be always historically this area you know a lot of resistance actions would take place in it and um uh, whether it's like throwing molotov cocktails or stones or you know whatever it is <laughs> and i think um in this case we have somebody who who is trained because he's an ex-service member in the palestinian presidential guard um, so he's highly trained. He knows what he's doing uh, on the level of, you know, conducting this attack. He draws by shooting at a bus. He draws the army in and he's already created like uh, multiple uh, places where he can also hide and fight from uh, before the attack and uh, taking the high ground and using a rifle that is apparently a sniping rifle in his uh, attack and um, injuring eight soldiers or injuring seven soldiers and killing one. Um, at least this is what the Israelis have uh, claimed. So, I mean, you know, so this is a kind of like uh, uh, a, a, the, the sophistication of the attack comes from the fact that this particular person has uh, military training and was able to use uh, the geography that he knows very well um, through his, you know, uh, upbringing in, in the Ribzir and the area and the weather conditions that were foggy on that day uh, to his advantage. And that's why it lasted for a long time. Although I think there's an exaggeration by the Israelis on the fogginess of it because they're trying to hide their own cowardice uh, in terms of trying to engage this person. Uh, they didn't expect this form of, of, of engagement in the fire uh, fight and uh, you know having eight soldiers injured 
And then they chose the air power, which is always uh, the choice for a lot of these Western uh, militaries when they don't want to engage in actual uh, battle. And, you know, I mean, on some level, I mean, I'm not saying, you know, it's a solution for these armies to use air power, but on some level, it also shows you that, um, you know, um, risk averse militaries, lack of heroism, this kind of post heroic warfare, especially when considering that even the soldier that was killed was from the Divdivan unit, which is a commander unit. So, you know, they're the ones that are supposed to like be able to take somebody uh, like Mujahid Karaja, who's, you know, um, one individual with a sniping rifle uh, with no other cover uh, and, you know, facing a, a uh, myriad soldiers and units that were on the scene uh, for five and a half hours uh, of combat. So it does show this kind of Israeli vulnerability, which is the vulnerability that, you know, I've spoken about from the beginning of this war. It's a vulnerability that also, you know, um, takes uh, the current Israeli state to a situation where they can shock, but they cannot, you know, you know, they cannot ah, And um, maybe this is a weird thing, but you know, there's always been this kind of like shock and awe doctrine that, you know, has been done in, in, in a lot of warfare. And I think for a lot of Palestinians now, yeah, they shock. They, they, they're able to inflict horror. They're able to use the tons of thousands of um, weapons and uh, uh, being given by the United States uh, and other countries throughout the Western world. Uh, to Israel and drop them from Gaza. They're, be, they're able to use air power, but at the core of it as well, um, they've lost this kind of creative, innovative, heroic edge that defined um, much of Israel militarism in its beginning in early years. And that actually caught and was partly used as part of their propaganda to gain a lot of sympathy and support from across the world. Um, you know, the, the sophisticated intelligence operations, the ability to infiltrate Iran, the ability to... Um, I don't mean that they, they can't do that now at, at any level. But I think for most people now looking at, at, at the Palestinian conflict, they would see more innovation, creativity, and heroism on part of the Palestinian side. They would see more of a creative agency at play, uh, even in terms of technological developments that are you know, constructed from the, the immediate environment of Gaza, a coastal plain, um, uh, the way, uh, you know, Gaza was able to create a labyrinth of, of tunnels that are until today not beaten and was not being able to beat by Israel's, um, you know, engineering units that came into the Gaza Strip uh, in any significant way or manner. Um, you know, trying to overwhelm them to water or trying to do a lot of other things. I mean, it, it seems it, it's reasonable to say that uh, the success in terms of the underground subterranean warfare uh, has not been that that significant when it comes to, to Israel war. And that goes also for Mujahid, you know, a, a fighter trained um, by the Americans, probably because the presidential guard are trained by the, the Americans. And, you know, in 2009, when Keith Dayton, which was a general, an American general who, who oversaw the reformulation of the Palestinian security forces in the West Bank as a counter terrorist force that would help Israel um, um, fight Palestinian resistance. Um, you know, a lot of these guys were, were trained and he, he claimed that they've created new Palestinians and perhaps Mujahid is one of those new Palestinians uh, on some level that have now created this kind of disruptive uh, operation uh, in the Ramallah area. But it's also important to note that you know, this is not, you know, this is not the only uh, attack in Ramallah in the past, uh, you know, since October 7th. Ramallah is, is not only the city, it's a, it's a, it's a lab, like, it has a huge um, ruler areas around it that link to it in a very close net relationship historically, at least um, in recent years as well. It has been entrenched and reinforced because of demographic expansion, 
and because of urbanization and because of you know um, the position of Ramallah as a center and the Ramallah rural areas have always been a hotbed of Palestinian resistance uh, more so than Ramallah itself perhaps although that's not also completely true because of um, you know the influence of political parties uh, and the presence of a lot of uh, the ideologies that are also present in the Gaza Strip and their competition amongst each other. So there's been a long history and tradition of resistance. But, you know, unlike the North West Bank, where it's concentrated in perhaps dense urban spaces, etc., in Ramallah, it was generally speaking more clandestine networks that operated and then created uh, uh, forms of attack rather than, you know, um, uh, uh, organization in the open if you want uh, so um, that is just part of it and I, I that's part of the story here the second part is that in the past couple of years Jared there has been this kind of widespread armament armament of the Palestinians in the West Bank through smuggling routes coming from Jordan um, through the robbery of Israel's own defense bases and then a lot of these arms would make them into the West Bank uh, through, you know, crime networks and and bandits and uh, uh, you know people from the underground world um, who operate also and, and are significant in this realm. So I mean, it's not by coincidence that you know um, today we see that there's a lot of uh, you know resistance operating because it's also you know relates to the availability of weapons. It relates to um, the easiness of which to get a, a rifle, um, the ease to which um, also this key kind of environmental factors play in producing whether organized or individualistic attacks that you know are happening in a in a much more sophisticated level in the West Bank in the past uh, year or so, and among that the entry of IEDs. Um, that seem to be growing in terms of their sophistication and um, blasting power, um, especially in the north uh, of the West Bank, and also the persistence. I mean, I mean, for me, I, I didn't even you know foresee this, but um, because I thought Israel would be able uh, to to render the the Palestinian resistance in the north of West Bank uh, weak and fail and fighting for its survival. Um, without a lot of hope for it to to persist but after six months of intense and brutal campaigns also in places like Nur Shams uh, um, uh, refugee camp in Tulkarim or in Jenin uh, or Tobas or other areas um, I think there's more tenacity and persistence than you know uh, I've seen or I, I was able to foresee in, in, in November or December I thought, thought because there's tolerance now for killing us in mass and there's, you know, the use of air power. Um, but, you know, I think uh, at least on some level that that persistence proves to some degree that there's a, more of a tenacity and persi uh, persistence and agility uh, in this very early development of uh, Palestinian armed resistance in the north of the West Bank. And again, there are some operations that are, you know, increasingly more sophisticated in terms of their, the tactics use and, and operational uh, agility and creativity uh, within them. I appreciate that overview um, very much. So let's talk about deformation. You know, this is something that, um, you know, you talk about through this essay, um, the one, the bleeding forms essay. And we've mm -hmm. talked about it with you a little bit before. Um, and, you know, I just want to get to like some, some more specificity. And I think, you know, in some realm, um, earlier in the conversation, as you were talking about how there is both with the Zionists, like, you know, some level of rational planning, planning and decision making around um, like, for instance, their strategies within the West Bank, why they would go after, you know, aid, um, people delivering aid, the hospital, et cetera. Um, and, and the idea, I mean, people have talked about like the road that they've sort of constructed through Gaza, you know, and um, 
you know, their, their ability to separate or to humiliate people passing from the, the North to the South and so on. Um, and, and this idea of a buffer zone, you know, trying to create a bigger buffer zone. And in some ways, I mean, that probably speaks to something that the U S was urging early on, which was to, to start to work on their plan for the day after, you know, um, which is not to say that they didn't have one at all, but, you know, uh, you know, the U.S., I think, in in pushing that was not pushing some sort of humanitarian version of the day after, but was more thinking about how do you, you know, reestablish dominance and security and, and, you know, maintain your stability as a state. And I guess in some ways this gets to the question of deformation, too, because I think, you know, we could talk about the kind of, um, you know, political challenges uh, that October 7th has still created for Israel as a state. We could talk about how in the north, um, you know, I just saw a report today from some uh, Israeli official in the north of, uh, you know, occupied Palestine saying that, um, you know, basically like there's a huge that there's still not security for people within the north at all and that they're you know that they don't see a strategy or a plan necessarily from israel in terms of how do we reestablish, uh you know so-called safety and security for people who are living close to the armistice lines with with lebanon um and so yeah i don't know i mean i i, I thought maybe we could enter into this discussion of deformation there in part i wanted to think about deformation as juxtaposed with de decolonization because you're kind of working with those two um concepts in that essay and I, you know i realize it's a bit of a you're working with some abstractions and some critical theory and things like this in the essay as well but yeah go ahead i mean look the one of the biggest discussions around what happened on october 7th is whether it's palestinian or you know perhaps across the globe um, even among the left, I guess, in the, in the U.S. and other places, um, has been like, did anybody anticipate the reaction you know, like that Israel has uh, committed? And, you know, assigning some sort of blame to the resistance for taking this kind of uh, uh, overflowing of people across the border in a very sophisticated, offensive military maneuver um, that caught Israel off guard and, um, you know, embarrassed it and destroyed its deterrence and created a dissonance within its own society um, at that particular moment uh, when it happened. And I think that, you know, that kind of discussion is recurrent because on some level, what is different, and we talked about this, I think, before, about this current historical moment is that the resistance evolved to have kind of like the ability to affect a strategic change, um, take a decision on it, um, to have an intentionality and rationality behind it, but it's also wedded to this kind of decider, the person or the individual taking the decision. That represents, of course, a collective. And I think that it's easy, you know, when you see the responses, even, you know, in the beginning, early days, you know, of a lot of intellectuals, that is just, you know, part of the background of how they're thinking about it. And unlike, you know, the spontaneous eruption of collective decisions that are not really decisions, you know, like Intifada and the first Intifada specifically, um, this kind of uh, mass eruption of, of uh, political action that was then organized and the subversive rhythms of the intifadas were, you know, given a voice through united leadership and other groups that formed to try and, you know, situate themselves as the people that would summon and organize the form of action on a specific day, etc. But that initial disruption in the colonial form and order and condition in 1987 or also in 2000 were not necessarily assigned to a specific uh, individual or organization, etc. Although the Israelis and a lot of the Zionists, you know, accused Arafat 
in the second intifada of being behind the intifada and the person who decided uh, uh, for the second intifada. And that is, you know, not a necessarily a historical fact, more so Arafat decide not to quell it, which is a different, uh, you know, a different form of decision than instigating it. Uh, at least this is my opinion. Um, so, so there's this 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 strategic actor with the ability to affect the strategic condition, and it's wedded within a specific locus and geography in the Gaza Strip. And there's a history, and we talked about that, George. So I don't want to like repeat myself when it comes to how this kind of evolved, but there's that history around why now we have you know a locus, a guerrilla movement, a you know. Uh, uh, why it's Hamas, not somebody else. Uh, you know, all these questions that come uh, to the fore when it comes to October 7th as this moment that condenses a lot of the developments throughout the three decades um, uh, before Oslo and since Oslo. Um, and to me, at least, um, that is one of the pitfalls of, of October 7th because you can easily accuse the Palestinian resistance of being responsible for what happened on some level. You can like direct some of your anger at it, even among Palestinians, like in Gaza or otherwise. You know, if you're feeling your world is destroyed and you're, you have anger, that can go in different places and um, it's normal. Um, so there's that, that form of element. So we have to deal with this and we have to understand where this kind of deciding ability came. And, and I think for me, it's important that in the lexicon of like, you know, legal scars and critic and not critical, but a lot of the theories around, you know, Schmidt and others, sovereignty is generally about preserving an order. It's about rendering a state of exception to preserve, not to deform. And I think for me, when resistance have decided this, it decided on the deformation of, of the current conditions and order for a lot of different reasons. Uh, it has this kind of rational, strategic, utilitarian, you know, um, uh, conception. It's still part of a political lexicon that is highly, you know, in, you know, that intends to uh, figure uh, more political space figuring out what may Palestinians hope for, um, you know, attempting um, to open uh, the horizon of political possibilities. So all of that is, 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 is a significant component of it. And I think it's important, but it's also, you know, in many ways, um, for me, resistance is also kind of this kind of formless operation. It's, it, it wants to bring things down in the world because the world is not ours, you know? So it, it, it wants to take things down in the world. It wants them to go into this kind of ground zero, level zero. Um, and when I say it wants, I'm not saying that necessarily a, a specific person or a collectivity or even subjectivity is behind this kind of form of intentionality. Is that for me, resistance as a concept is also this kind of formless operation that flows from the colonial form itself, in in a very similar way to what you know George Bataille would describe as the informe or uh, the formless, as this kind of you know uh, disruption of the relationship between the signifier and the signified that enables us to construct a, you know new language, in his critical dictionary, and I found inspiration in that to speak perhaps slightly about, uh, although you know Bataille is using it as an aesthetic you know perhaps category. I'm using it here in, in, in more political terms, and you know we can criticize that as well. But at least on some level, that's what I was thinking. And I think this is important because for me, it also cuts across some of the more rigid modalities of looking at power and resistance, specifically in, in you know critical theory through Foucault's work, which tends to see resistance as part of this kind of self-enclosed uh system where power enacts itself or resistance is the opportunity for power to reassert itself and i saw a lot of people falling in this trap of thinking israel is now reasserting its power 
and taking this opportunity to reassert its power. And then on some level, maybe, I mean, maybe perhaps this is this is how Israeli leaders and security establishment elites saw this moment as this opportunity to reassert its power, to show what it's capable of, to show its ability to be an efficient killing machine as its uh, ex, um, you know, chief of staff of the Israeli army said uh, uh, about its uh, about Israel's army and its new methods of killing that we're now seeing manifest in the Gaza Strip. But I think, at least for me, that is not, you know, that renders resistance as almost a product of power and opportunity for power to reassert itself without ability to affect something within the colonial condition itself. And historically speaking, I think Oslo is a product of Palestinian resistance. Yes, it did allow Israel to persist with its colonialism, but it also was on some level a concession on part of the Israeli uh, colonial regime because it also loosened or defied and deformed Israel's ability to continue in military direct occupation. So it had to search for an indirect one. Yes, that was part of its thinking from before 1993, that it wants a form of indirect control. But that is the moment that that colonial regime had to had a, a process that deformed its form in the 80s, in the early 80s, and created this kind of indirect control, finding a willing partner in the PLO, now exiled in Tunisia in 1993, and the whole story of Oslo. And it's same in and also in 2000, the second intifada erupts that it also deforms the colonial regime's ability to continue and persist, for example, in settler colonial project and the building, the building of settlements within uh, the Gaza Strip. It deformed uh, Israel's ability uh, to normalize these settlements within the Gaza Strip. It had to withdraw and it created this situation where it withdrew from one geographic locus while doubling down in, a, in another place, which was the West Bank, uh, specifically outside of the Janin area. So I think for me, it's also important to show that this power to render things formless, yes, it does arouse sometimes new formations that are not necessarily amenable always to the Palestinians and create their own complexities and, and problems. But also what it does, it, it shows people that you know, history is not just a pile of ruins. And it and and I think that's part of like, you know, the critical engagement generally of how we view history, that we need to find or figure ways of remembering and looking at history in a way that also, you know, asserts and shows um, um, in this instance, the Palestinians, but other people that you know, resistances do, you know, affect uh, things. It might not be to our expectations or imagination or, you know, the utopia didn't arrive, but it does, it does render the colonial regime at least momentary deformed. And this is part of what's happening now on October 7th, is that we're in this moment uh, where, you know, the colonial regime that exists at least around Gaza Strip before, uh, October 7th, is rendered deformed. In response, Israel is deforming and disfiguring and degrading and humiliating the Palestinians of the Gaza Strip uh, and also the Palestinians in the West Bank and other places, showcasing also its power of destruction, attempting to rebuild its deterrence, trying to shock people. But at the same time, in, in many ways, it still has to reckon with uh, this, this process of deformation that the Palestinian resistance instigated through this overflowing of, of the borders. So that's what I was trying to kind of encapsulate at some level. Uh, and, a, and a second, I think, important element, at least for me, um, was, you know, the ability to speak about resistance as an experience that does not necessarily think in utilitarian terms, but not making it, you know, an insane gesture. You know that's you know my my also uh, my my also attempt. It's not necessarily that you know having this kind of experience of freedom, this uh, sovereign mo moment where you um, 
you know, take a decision like what happened October 7th doesn't mean that you, you don't calculate the responses and, and the rationality behind it and you don't have a rationale. Because I'm very wary, of course, of, of how politically this would be received specifically outside of Palestine in an environment that actually looks at resistance as just a form of terror or, you know, as a profane act. And, you know, we've talked about that a lot. Um, but there is part of the part of the experience of resistance is an experience of freedom. It's transgressing the limits of finitude itself, death. And in in many ways, it, it's it's only through you know thinking that moment you resist, uh, and not necessarily always projecting something onto the future. And I think that's that is co-present in, in a lot of people who resist, and and we can see that and resistance fighters specifically, we can see that on an individual level in terms of the resistance fighters, that when they're not necessarily building a complete program of what they would want um, in terms of, you know, this tactic reaches to this or this or that, and, you know, they're thinking through all these elements. Of course, nobody expects any fighter to do that on a, on a strictly individual level. But there's still that level of imagination uh, present and the, the future projection that, you know, resistance has, you know, this kind of utility in time. But in many ways, co-present with that is resistance as an experience, uh, self-sacrifice as an experience that liberates uh, whether the individual subject or the collective subject. Uh, in this case, in October 7th, it was a collective maneuver. And it has these two elements together, um, co-present. So there's that moment of just, um, you know, acting to reassert your subjectivity, to reconstitute it, to um, experience that kind of sovereign uh, decision, and also battalion terms, which which is not non-utilitarian. It's not about preserving order. It's about just the experience itself of not thinking anything else but the experience itself and there is that element within that um so they might be co-present in the same moment and i think for me october 7th resembles and embodies these things but also the resistance in the north of west bank and also mujahid yesterday and also you know there's these elements um that come together in in resistance where uh once you obfuscate the fear of death and once you're able to liberate yourself from these kind of shackles and from the infliction of horror, most people within resistance, um, you know, have this kind of experience of ultimate freedom, um, although they might end up being killed, but within the time frame between their decision to engage in resistance and the moment, you know, the power asserts itself or kills or arrests or whatever, that is a moment uh, of ultimate freedom. And a lot of people, I think, even the ones who, you know, were arrested and then later came out and, and through my research that comes across, you know, these are the moments that they felt uh, truly, as they would say, human, no? So, um, so there's that kind of experience also embodied within this, but it doesn't take away from from you know the rationality, utilitarian, political, negotiating intentionality that also exists within this whole, uh, uh, you know, within October seventh as an offensive maneuver. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as you were talking about that, it just reminded me of this clip. Um, actually, I think I'll. No, I want to play it. I don't want to get a copyright thing or whatever. But um, basically. Uh, if folks have watched Vanguard, I think it's called Vanguard of the Revolution. It's uh, a um, documentary on the Black Panther Party, but there's a there's a clip in it where a couple of members of the Los Angeles Black Panther Party were talking about the the first SWAT raid. I think it was the first SWAT raid in U.S. history. Actually, like I think it was at the time that SWAT was invented. Um, but 
you know, they they had like Tommy, they had like uh, Thompson submachine guns and stuff like that in their office as they're being raided. And they were in a shootout for like hours and hours. And um, anyways, they just they're talking about it in the sense of, um, you know, that the freedom that they felt actually in that moment, which is, you know, might be. You know, might seem strange to people, right? Like this, you're you're actually being raided by a SWAT team with superior firepower, et cetera. But they were able to hold them off for hours and hours, and none of them, I don't believe any of them were actually killed in that operation. Um, and um anyways, they they just des they describe just what you're talking about in terms of the the feeling of freedom that they felt uh, absolutely in that moment. Um Sorry, I know that's like a, a tangent that's not really related, but um, so let's see. I want to talk about, I don't know. So, so in thinking about deformation, this is actually not precisely a question that, that I sent you, but um, you know, it's it's also just fascinating in terms of the international ramifications that continue to to kind of echo out from October 7th and the ongoing, you know, genocide. And I mean, in the U.S., you know, we have on the one hand, these, you know, very cynical ceasefire bills that, you know, Russia and China recognized were essentially just asking Palestinians to cease fire without any um, any conditions at all um, placed upon Israel. Um, even even really conditions of ensuring aid and everything else. Um, but, uh, you know, at the same time, then, I mean, you know, this gets vetoed and there's other bills going forward so there's these different ceasefire proposals that go back and forth um and you know i think a lot of people recognize that act by the u.s as this very cynical attempt to to kind of present itself as you know we're the ones who want to cease fire it's the palestinians who are refusing it and it's countries like russia and china who are against it even as you know, there's been so many UN security resolutions calling for a ceasefire that the U.S. has vetoed by, um, you know, all kinds of countries putting them forward. But the the peace, you know, then I think it was yesterday or last night that a bill passed um, that Biden like immediately signs that, um, you know, gives another, you know, I think somewhere I've seen numbers between 3.2 and $4 billion in security aid um, to Israel. My guess is that that's actually just sort of the annual amount that always comes from, you know, all the way back, probably from Obama or whatever. But like that, you know, that the reality is that the U.S. plans to give military assistance to Israel on a recurring basis. Um and but it, but in that proposal, also, they made sure that UNRWA was defunded for another two years. They also made sure that um, mm -hmm. the 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 Human Rights um, Council or I forget the exact term, but the, it's the human rights aspect uh, investigations aspect of the UN um, that has been seeking to really, um, you know, do investigations into Israel's actions, et cetera the U S would defund any support that it had for that. Um, and so, you know, and this passes with an overwhelming majority of Democrats, it actually was fairly divided among Republicans, um, you know, which is partly for, you know, U S partisan, you know, maneuvering and whatnot, but, um, it's not to say that Republicans are not, you know, supportive of Zionism because they absolutely are. But it's just interesting because, again, like thinking about deformation, I do have questions in my mind of how sustainable is support globally for Israel, knowing how much that they actually do need on a constant basis to hold up this, you know, settler garrison, you know, entity, you know, that is just not um, one you know, is an, is just this kind of 
colonial imposition in the region. Um, it's this military outpost. And it also is struggling to defend itself and needs this constant support to defend itself, quote unquote, defend itself. It's, I shouldn't even use that term. Um, so, yeah, I mean, again, like thinking, I guess, about deformation and these maneuverings around ceasefire and support. Um, you know, we see quite clearly that the United States is still very strident in its support of uh, Israel and is, you know, going after, I think another thing that they said is that, you know, they won't fund any international body that has anti-Israel politics, basically, you know, um, and so, yeah, anyway, I, I, I'm rambling here, but these are things I'm thinking about too, in terms of this deformation of like, there's a lot globally that has to uphold the Zionist project. Um, and I, I do think that among so many people, they're now very much like, why are we doing this? Like not, not so much, I recognize in the United States, especially at a governmental level, it hasn't reached that level at all. Um, but I think for, for, you know, billions of people across the world, it has. And so I just keep wondering at what point this will begin to more strongly and strongly resonate with some of the governments within the world, or if they just really don't give a fuck, right? Or if it just really that they just like, you know, they don't exist at the consent of the governed. It, we're in a world where governments coerce their populations into what they see as their strategic interests. Um, but even still, I, I don't think the support of Israel feels like a strategic interest for you know, most of the world these days. So yeah, I don't know. I'm sorry. That's a lot. And it's um, incoherent probably. No, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, I, I know what you're asking. I mean, look, it's always hard to assess the repercussions of any, any event, um, specifically in the immediate um, reality of still living and persisting within it. Why, why do I say that? For instance, you know, after the second intifada, for instance, um, a lot of people in the, you know, in Palestine, specifically in the West Bank, you know, would assess the second intifada as a defeat. And it was reinforced by the political regime that rose in the, you know, in the wake of the second intifada, the Mahmoud Abbas regime that came after the death of Arafat which wanted to also enshrine that it was a defeat because it's also a defeated regime that wants to sustain cooperation with Israel as a, as a form of engagement. However, you know, was really the second intifada a defeat in this kind of like total, you know, uh, sense of the word? It wasn't, you know, because without the second intifada, we wouldn't have the October 7th, we wouldn't have the development of the guerrilla movement. We wouldn't have the development of the organization that you know innovates, creates, enables the buildup of of uh, the tunnel networks. That you know you wouldn't you would have maybe something else, but at least on that level, um, you know it's always very hard to assess how an event would actually transpire over time. And I do think that October seventh is significant. Not only is it a deformation of the current relationship between Gaza and the colonial state, um, whether materially, physically, or whether in terms of how it how this war will end if it ends in a in a in a ceasefire agreement, for instance, we don't even know that. Uh, that it's still up for grabs. Maybe, you know, we'll have this kind of war of attrition persist for a long time. But what is at least for me uh important is that yes now the us is paying a price i don't know how heavy for its support of israel um now we have potentially an american president losing an election because of his support of israel not uh because he supports the palestinians or have sympathies for the palestinians um now we have a situation where uh, more of the world knows, uh, more of the world is aware, conscious of what has happened or is happening in the Palestine for the past hundred years, where the public opinion and its mood is, has changed, and where American 
hypocrisy is laid bare. I mean, a lot of countries out of opportunistic motivations or genuine motivations, whatever, are also pointing all the time, you know, this kind of form of American hypocrisy when it comes to its position in Ukraine and Palestine and, you know, sustaining this kind of liberal international order while also sustaining and enabling uh, the genocide to continue. And that's why for, it's important for the U.S. somewhat and for the Biden administration specifically to now kind of posture around a ceasefire, try to push things towards a ceasefire. And, you know, there's a lot of debate around whether the American government does have the influence to stop the war or not. I mean, historically speaking, most Israeli wars ended with, you know, foreign intervention. Um, and somewhat in many instances, Israel also wanted to end the war. Uh, it didn't want to fight the long war. Perhaps the mood in Israel has changed in terms of, okay, this is a war and we have to fight it for a long time and we need to like take this opportunity uh, and move uh, deeper and deeper in time to attempt and defeat uh, and give a significant blow to the resistance in Gaza and perhaps Lebanon and other places. Um, so we'll be in war for two years or three years, but then things will, you know, uh, come out of it uh, much better. Um, and it's a calculation that perhaps some of the Israeli leaders and military and security elites are thinking. But it is also significant to just say that historically, yes, American intervention did stop many of, of, of the wars um, that Israel had with Arab countries or with Lebanon in 2006, for instance, or in other areas, or some other country would come and uh, there would be a desire. And right now, I think the Israelis assess that, yes, they're in a war of attrition. Yes, it's costing them economically. Yes, it's costing them in terms of personnel and in terms of their material power. Um, but they're thinking that there's a lot of reckoning that would happen after a war. They want to postpone. They're thinking this is an opportunity to go deeper and try to change things in a significant radical way. Um, they're thinking they want to make the world more consistent uh, and more amenable to their own uh, view of their own, uh, you know, of their their own view of reality. So there is that kind of desire and will on the Israeli side to continue with with the war as it happens. I currently, more cynical, I see Biden's administration maneuvers as more of a posturing rather than a real, you know, uh, attempt at ending the war. Um, and I think even the current American proposal is a way uh, to sustain the war, but give some sort of respite. But I do think at the same time that, you know, the current administration in the U.S. is very, very concerned about the prospects of it losing the elections in November uh, from this war. So there's an electoral interest that is, you know, coming head uh, with Israeli interest. They're, 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 you know, slowly, the more, the more time passes, um, the American administration yearning for an end, or at least a rhythm that is that would take the eyes and ears of people from the Gaza situation becomes more necessary. And I think that's what the Americans want. They want this kind of, not an end, but they want Gaza to be a, a place that doesn't grasp people's attention, um, that is not yet still part of like the leftist uh, American discussion, that is part of the discussion among many Arab and Muslim Americans, among many of the, you know, different stratas that have, you know, voiced support for the Palestinians and are problem problematizing the success of Biden in the, in the coming election. So I think that's what the Americans, you know, are moving towards, supporting Israel, giving it cover, uh, participating actively in the war against the Palestinian people, while at the same time posturing and, you know, winding down uh, the war in a way that would not render Israel without the capacity to act, but would also, um, you know, help them um, say to their own people, we've done a lot to change the situation, we've reached a ceasefire, and we're entering, you know, 
we're putting aid uh, into Gaza, elevating the situation. So they would say that we're much better than you know the alternative because if Trump comes, um, Trump will not do anything towards the Palestinians in Gaza. You know that that would be the rhetoric. I think the strategy of the Democratic Party as they you know move into the summer and as the election you know season becomes uh, closer and closer. Yeah, and this is one of the problems too of like the the centering of APAC, you know, a little bit because like the, there's like this group that started recently that's, um, you know, see, positioning itself as an opposition to APAC, and it's basically trying to tie APAC to all right wing politicians, and um, you know, it's true. I mean, it, the there is more money or there's more Republicans who are recipients of APAC funding, but there's so many Democrats. I mean, almost all of them. And so it's like sort of, I think the strategy, if I'm to look at it in good faith is to say, we want to connect this to the far right, to the most, you know, to the kind of far right policies that uh, Israel represents and the far right politicians that are in line with these things. But, it's really absurd on its face because there's no government official in the United States in any office that has received as much money from Zionist interests as Joe Biden has. He's over five million dollars in his career. And it's not all APAC. You know, I mean, I'm sure some of it is, but this is also the problem. I mean, I do think that APAC is a is an important um you know, force and, but it's kind of like the same thing. I mean, I remember we were, we had a conversation years ago. Um, why am I blanking on this friend's name? Um, uh, dang it. Um, sorry. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not coming through to me right now, but, um, he's one of the people who was a part of, Parkland, right? So he's a part of movement for our lives. It was a an anti gun, um, you know, organization basically that came out of the school shooting at Parkland, and he, you know, came out of it and just said, you know, the United States is a weapons company, you know, and um, that that th yes, the NRA is an important, um, you know, strategic opponent for certain reasons. His name is Matt Dyche. Um, sorry, Matt. Um, but the the point that he made too is like, yeah, I mean, but what about Boeing? What about Raytheon? What about Smith and Wesson? What about like every you know every company and every um, corporation, you know? And I, and again, like if we're talking about Israel, we have to talk about those things too, right? I mean, that we're selling the you know part of this this military aid becomes this kind of pass through right between the US government and weapons companies US weapons companies right of we're going to send Israel aid you know military aid in the form of money that they're going to then just pay to US weapons manufacturers and contractors to buy these things right and so it's a form of you know basically govern government welfare for the military industrial complex you know and so my point is just to say that the the focus on apac and trying to tie apac as this just far right or conservative thing um one it's not accurate but two it doesn't really deal with the the political economy of the united states with the way that you know so much of um our financial activity as a country is just tied up in in warfare you know and so again i don't know that this is not a question this is a rant from me but um you know i don't know i mean i mean i think this is what you're trying to say is that you know i mean there's a big debate around this jared and like you know why the u.s supports israel you know, like i mean and we've we've talked about this before and you know, it's significant for me, for instance, if you go and like uh, look at a lot of like these armchair uh, think tank 
people who are close to the APAC or um, the Israel lobby more broadly, like the Nasras, etc. Many of them write books about the unbreakable uh, relationship between Israel and the US. And there's this kind of insistence, neurotic insistence on reasserting to what extent this relationship is unbreakable because of cultural elements and pioneering settler spirit and, um, you know, uh, strategic considerations and whatever it is that, you know, you, you will you will argue and place front and center. Uh, for me, of course, the political economy is, is central, the strategic elements are central. A lot of people would place Israel as central to this kind of like, um, empire building and sustaining a regime uh you know a regional regime that is amenable to american interest in the region and perhaps so i mean there are people that make the other argument as well that it's not you know amenable to to american interests and that you know the arabs would have been happy for example to be part of the pax americana or like the american empire um but you know israel is in the middle and sometimes that you know uh, actually created more antagonism than uh, helped the American uh, uh, empire and its strategic interest of oil and uh, denying um, those reserves from any other emerging power like at least for a while Soviet Union or now China. But at least for me, I mean, um, I do think this very fact that you need to write so many books and articles asserting that relationship means that there's something that is actually, um, you know, when you have a good relationship, you don't need to affirm it all the time. You know, like you don't need to say, I love you all the time. And, you know, um, just love flows and it's there. Uh, and I think that that already tells me that there's something that, you know, uh, on some level that is vulnerable in that relationship um because it's highly uh predicated on a lot of delusions lies and you know made up uh, uh factors and you know um some of it might be nostalgia for the crusades i don't know i mean you know people build a lot of you know a lot of uh elements around that the jewish question and 19th century anti-semitism and you know, it's so complicated, this whole like ideological construction of Israel itself, its relationship to Europe, the relationship to empire. And, and you know, I, I think for us, from a Palestinian perspective, and I think Mahmoud Darwish said it best, I mean, he, he was sitting, and I think in one of Lou Goddard, he's a French filmmaker's uh, movie, and, and, and this journalist asked him, you know, uh, you Palestinians are like known in the world although sometimes people confuse me with the pakistani but yeah i mean um um and mahmoud darwish says that we're known or we're famous because um you're our, you know you're our enemies she was an israeli journalist asking him this um we're not famous because of anything special imbued within us you know and there's something around that you know uh whole um Palestine, its relationship to religions, its relationship to uh, strategic interests, its relationship to settler colonialism and, you know, the Jewish question, uh, the Holocaust and uh, the settler spirit. And and I, I honestly, I don't have an answer, but I do, I don't believe that there's anything necessarily significant about why Israel is supported by the U.S. Uh, in a way that makes sense on any of these levels. Um, uh, uh, in what I mean by that is that on a strategic argument, you can make the argument that makes very convincing, uh, um, uh, very convincing that Israel is a strategic burden and that America does not benefit from Israel. On a cultural argument basis, you know, culture changes. It's not a fixed, you know, thing that can be always sustained through time. 
cultural and people's attitudes and norms and how they think over things and how they um, build and construct meaning around this world is not like a fixed element and and, and things can change. Um, so if there's a cultural element to it, it also can change. Um, if it's, you know, a hearkening back to some sort of nostalgia uh, of conquering the Holy Land or maybe, I don't know, but, you know, um, would a nostalgic exercise explain, you know, this uh, complete support? Perhaps the evangelical Christians also have like a theory around how Israel needs to be placed and constructed on biblical terms. And so there's that kind of religious element and the ideological foreclosure around it. But, you know, on, on a lot of other levels, again, these things could possibly uh, change. They don't make sense just standing by themselves um, even from a perspective of political economy does really the u.s need israel for weapons uh, or weapon development is that like such a necessary nod in its uh political i mean people make that argument but i also kind of you know doubt it i mean doubt it not in the sense that israel is not useful in, in constructing new weapon systems or being a place to test out weapons or being a place where new techniques and tactics can be developed. But, you know, the Americans do war by themselves. They support other countries doing war, um, bigger countries, um, more ammunition, more, you know. I mean, I, I think on some level that that also is not as convincing to me as, uh, you know, as it sounds that it's it's, you know, just part of this kind of military industrial complex that needs to be always fed. And that Israel plays a big role in all of that as a, as a war economy, etc. I think there is an element to that, and it's a strong one. But I wouldn't, like, you know, um, place it as the only determining factor in, 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 in U.S. support for Israel. And, and I think these kind of layered complexity around it, and also vulnerability of this relationship, that creates a lot of this discussion and that, you know, uh, make people spend a lot of time writing books and articles around it because it's not, you know, it's not very determined. And 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 for me, um, you know, as a Palestinian, I do know that at the end, that the empire looks at us as an obstacle, not as a uh, as not as an ally, and not as you know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I have no illusions around that. And as you know, many. In the Palestinian revolutionary tradition, we used to call, uh, you know, America as the head of the snake, and you know, it is the. It, it without the U.S., Israel could also, or without an empire backing it up, without this kind of strategic depth for Israel, Israel cannot really sustain itself in uh, as an ethno-nationalist, uh, racist, apartheid state that it is. It cannot, you know exist as such um this is not to say that you know jews cannot exist in palestine but um just the fact of this type of state can remain or not and i think israelis know that and if they didn't know that they've come to know it in 7th of october when they called you know um america to help uh, deter other actors in the region when they were in this kind of vulnerable position and they know it because they get $4 billion of aid that they use for military development. They know it because they need the ammunition from the military industrial complex in the US to actually sustain this war. So they know it on, on these levels. I mean, and if, if anybody doubted um, who's in charge in the relationship, at least on the level of uh, who needs more the other, I think it's clear that Israel needs the US more than the US probably needs Israel. Yeah. Yeah, I wish that level of clarity around the relationship. I mean, I, I understand you in terms of all the ways that it's complex, but there are still people who, you know, think that. I mean, I you know, and this is something we talked about it last time. I know you you got to go, so I'm not going to hold you much longer. But, um, but yeah, I, I would say that there are still people who think that Israel is kind of in charge. Right. You know, that that like that the United States is sort of 
um, you know, you use the the metaphor of the dog wagging the tail and that the that Israel is the dog and the United States is the tail. And I just think that's total. I mean, I think it's to, I, I not even think it is inaccurate, you know, and I agree that um, what you said in terms of, you know, having to pick up the phone on October 8th and say, hey, we don't have enough, you know, weapons to fight this war. We don't we're not able to deter all of these different forces. Um, I think it's quite clear that, um, you know, that Israel could not continue to exist without strong support of, you know, exist as it as it does um, without strong, you know, support economically, militarily, et cetera, from um, from, like you said, some empire, you know, the United States currently for sure. Um, so anyways, I know that that you do have to go. Um, I'm sure we'll pick this up again in, you know, a couple of weeks or or whatever. But it's always a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, it's been great to be in conversation with you again. And, um, you know, I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. I'm happy to be with you anytime and talk. So we'll do it again. We will As do it again. Many people are saying I, I became a co-host. So. Um, yeah 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 you saw that yeah there's a there's a lot of good a lot of good comments in the chat sorry folks that i didn't bring in some of your questions uh maybe we'll save some of them and and try to come back to them next time we we come together so um anyways yeah thank you again and uh we'll we'll be in touch again to to do this again uh my co-host abud <laughs>